Hello everyone. In this video lecture, I'm going to go over the, an analysis of setting throughout this novel, or at least throughout the sections that you've read thus far, tying together the representation of the setting of Audrey's home as it evolves. I've already indicated to you that the home and Audrey's exclusion from it in her conversation with Hoff is a representation of a way in which Audrey has difficulty reintegrating herself into a family that well, lacks her father, and thus doesn't seem to be a family at all. Much of her uh, reflection in this section of the chapter deals with the nature of family. After all, she says that a family was supposed to be a mother, a father, and a child, and yet here we have a father, a daughter, and a pirate. So there's this uh, commentary throughout this section of the text on the nature of family and the constructedness of family, how families are built, how they are defined, and uh, the father's argument as to family being uh, those individuals who choose to enter into a mutually supportive relationship with one another against the perspectives of Toph, his actual brother, and the grandmother who disapprove of the familial organization that has arisen out of uh, Walter's arrangement with Wilfred Moss or Uncle Toby. Through this section, as I analyze and break down some of these chapters and tie together the representation of Audrey's family and her grief, her experience of grief by way of the setting, I'm going to look at several different examples of setting throughout about 150 pages. Literary devices always tie together. There's a kind of unity to the presentation of a literary device across a work. We don't just examine a literary device in isolation through that process of close reading. That allows us to note things about a particular use of a literary device that can then be tied into other uses of that same literary device. It's how we really develop a body paragraph. We don't just look at a single example of a literary device. We look at three in a body paragraph, two or three. And we forge connections between different examples of that same device, showing how the setting or how a symbol evolves and develops over the course of the text. We create these series of connections that are intentional on the part of the author to convey and to construct meaning. And I'm going to be modeling that for you as I do close readings of individual passages and then tie them together into a cohesive understanding of, in this case, the setting of the home. All these different examples throughout the text, over 150 pages, tie into each other, support each other, and allow us to better understand those close reading examples that we've already performed. During this process, I'm going to be giving you short quotations from the text. Now, I'm going to read the entirety of each of these quotations when the time comes, but uh, I have given you both page numbers and short excerpts so that those of you who have the physical copy of the text can know the page and the quotation that I'm referring to by way of the page number. And those of you who have a digital copy of the text can use the short quotation to find the full quotation that I am drawing from. In this section of the text, it becomes clear that the setting of Audrey's home and Wednesday Pond, the pond behind the home, is a representation of both Audrey's family, her experience and her understanding, perhaps her subconscious understanding of her family, and her grief or her process of grieving her father and her fears about the loss of her father, because she still hasn't really come to terms with the fact that he's gone. He's trained her throughout her entire life to be unprepared for the reality of death. On page 99, we see that my dad explained that Uncle Toby had checked into a hotel temporarily. This would solve the problem of rooms. I could now move back into mine, and Toph could move downstairs into Uncle Toby's. So here we see Audrey's fear about displacement and loss. Later on in the novel, sections that we're not going to read, Uncle Toby retreats. He actually leaves Audrey and goes back to England uh, without telling her, because he can't really stand living in that same house and interacting with her. It only exacerbates his experience of loss and grief, and he doesn't want, in the same way, to burden her. Here, that fear about the potential of losing Uncle Toby as well is uh, explored by way of this moment when she did lose him, or when he was exiled from the home. This is my worst fear, that I would wake up one morning and Uncle Toby would be gone and we would be unable to separate the coffee filters. In essence, the loss of this familiar element of her life, this loss of the familial 
element of her life, the part of her family, has rendered the home alien. Those little details of life inside the home, those small actions that make a home familiar and comforting, like separating the coffee filters, all become alien and foreign and impossible because they've lost that connection to the human being, to that member of the family. Audrey recognizes that nature of family and home, that it is really something that you bring with you because it is not made up of the edifice or the domicile, it's made up of the people. And thus that home is alien to her because Uncle Toby is not there or because her father is not there. It's no longer a home. When she says later on in the same chapter to her uncle on page 104, that um, I was not very fond of the ceiling of room 203, but the rest of it was not bad. I liked how small and neat and portable it was. So she's saying this as she is visiting her uncle at the civil manor, right? Her quote unquote uncle. Well, not uh, really portable, but it reminded me of the dream I'd had of a portable room. The portable room could be attached to a train or truck. Everyone had a portable room that could attach. You could take your portable room anywhere. It had a bed, a bathroom, a blue carpet. That was all. When I told my Uncle Toby about my portable room montage dream, he'd said, that's called a camper, oddly. No, it was not a camper. Geez, I know what a camper is. This was a portable room. So as she is reconnecting with her uncle inside the quote unquote portable room, this substitute home or temporary home of the Civil Manor Hotel, she tells him about this ability to bring home with you wherever you go tied to the tortoise, Winifred, because of course she does exactly the same, carrying her house on her back. Here, it's that reflection, that home and the ability to enter into it is portable, it's mo mobile, right? She's found home again as she is here with her uncle. And that home ceases to be a home, that is the home in which she grows up and she lives regularly, ceases to be such because Toby has been displaced. She's thinking about this portable room because the room, the home itself has moved alongside him. It's no longer a home and she feels that sense of home and connection only when she rejoins him. That idea of being displaced from your familiar geography so easily, of being thrown out of yourself, of losing who you are, is repeated here because she is no longer herself and she's no longer home due to the fact that, well, she's been knocked out of her geography, she's been knocked out of the place where she is comfortable and familiar with the loss of her loved one. Now she can cling on to him and follow after him, chase after him and rediscover home again. The nature of home as being a reflection of the connections between the people that live within it comes to the forefront on page 106 in the metaphor of the heating vents and the way in which Audrey says that she could communicate with her uncle. She could reach him by whispering into the vents and he invents this story of his being able to hear her in the basement. What we have here is a representation of that connection between family members. And it's something that ties into the light and life that is given to Winifred the tortoise. On the very first page, we have that first reference to heating vents and what they represent in the story. On the first page of the novel, still I crouch down next to the window, feel the heat coming up for the vent. Is my tortoise dead? Should I go back? It's the heat from the vent that Audrey is trying to sort of step into. She's looking for heat. She's looking for warmth on the physical level here. But because she is so cold and isolated, because she is caught within the grip of icy terror, she's looking for a kind of human connection that is represented in her own mind, as we're going to see, by those heat vents. That is one of the reactions to grief, that Audrey is looking for intimate human contact that brings life again, that uh, allows us to step out of that path, the ebb between heartbeats. Remember that Winifred says that the ebb is like this path that becomes less a path the further along you travel. And the heartbeats are so few because they've slowed down in the cold. So they think that Winifred might be dead because she has, well, not been properly heated. She only comes to life. She only escapes the ebb when she experiences the heat, when those heating vents inside her home are cranked up to the max. Here, the same is true for Audrey. It's like she's dead, isolated, and lacking any kind of connection because she doesn't have the heat from the vents. 
the meaning of those events becomes clear, as I said, on page 106. The, the realization that it's a representation of the connection between family members and the community of support that can be offered to uplift us when we are experiencing grief and loss. When Uncle Toby says on 106, Uncle Toby's voice was all grown up again. So he's been sucking the helium from a balloon and his voice has become all high pitched and squeaky as he pretends to be Wedge or speaking for Wedge. Now it's adult and mature and we're getting the voice of a mature wisdom. He is no longer playing with Audrey as one would with a child. He's speaking to her in a sense as an adult. He's trying to encourage her to understand something mature. He asked me if I remembered how, when he moved from the guest room into the basement, in other words, when he moved from the same floor as them into the basement room, when it seemed like he was so far away, I'd complained that the basement was too far away. And what had he said? He had said to think about how all the heat vents in the house were connected like secret passages, how my room was connected to his room, and his room was connected to my dad's room, and my dad's room was connected to mine. Remember that idea, he said. So the house represents this secret series of intimate connections that are known only to the people therein. In fact, it's populated by those things. It's defined by those things. And that is a representation of family, that you have this interweaving of intimate knowledge of the other people that connect you with them. It's that understanding of those secrets, of those passageways, of the idiosyncrasies and the unique elements of each person that tie you together, allow you to understand them and become intimately familiar with them. And those vents, those intimate connections, those secret connections unknown to others who can't see them are what allow for open communication, connection, and warmth, heat, life to pass through you and to pass through that home that is a representation of the family. So here we see that symbolic setting of the home becomes a representation of how family is formed and how it supports one another or those webs of connection support one another when people experience loss and grief, the ebb of the tortoise. So there's this complex interweaving of the heat vents, the, the symbolic nature of the home, Winifred and the ebb, all as a commentary on the nature of family and grief and how we support each other through it by way of the intimate connections that define family. And Toby takes those connections and says, that's what ties us together and makes us a family. It's that familiarity that yokes us together, even if we are distant, even if we're far apart. And it's what gives us that vital life of light and air and heat that travels through the ventilation system and that keeps us alive. However, this entire paradigm or scheme of understanding for the home has been stabilized by the loss of Walter. Because after all, Audrey is having difficulty getting back into her home. She's being exiled from it, just like Uncle Toby was as he is cast out of the home. Our understanding of the representation of the home and its, me its meaning as setting is informed by the description that Audrey provides us on pages 40 and 41. That chapter begins with the line, there's a rumor, more than a rumor, a theory that Wednesday Pond has no bottom. So describing her home, you have the porch, you have the home itself, and then behind the home, right in their backyard, is Wednesday Pond, the bottomless pond, supposedly. I'm going to read two pages from this chapter much earlier in the novel that will allow us to better understand Audrey's emotional experience and the way she's processing grief and how this, this home represents not just her family, but also that experience of grief and how that grief is causing the home and family to begin to dissolve. There's a rumor, more than a rumor, a theory that Wednesday Pond has no bottom. My dad found this theory ridiculous. Bollocks, he said, of course it has a bottom. Uncle Toby, who did not find the theory ridiculous, said, well, Clint said, oh boy, said my dad, what? Nothing. Please continue. Clint said that a man disappeared into that pond once, and the police tried to dredge it, but lo and behold, there was no bottom to dredge. What we have here, then, in the pond, is a representation of loss and grief, that there is a body, like Walter Flower's own corpse, that has been tossed into the pond and never recovered. So it's a representation of loss and the experience of loss, of the inability to ever recover that body or that person that has been destroyed. So re recognizing that the pond, this great empty abyss of meaninglessness, of absence, 
uh, represents the loss of the father. We can better understand page 41, where she describes her home and its connection to that pond. As far back as I can remember, we have lived on Wednesday Place. The pond is our backyard. So behind their home, behind their family, hidden or concealed behind it, is this great empty well, this abyss that can't be seen from the front of the home. You can look at the surface of the front, the facade of the home, and it conceals everything. Just like Walter and the family and the connections of the family have tried to conceal the reality of death from Audrey, the reality of that great chasm, the abyss and the oblivion of loss and death. The porch wraps all the way around the house, all the way. You can go into orbit if you're not careful. The boards bounce when you walk. So thinking about that home, surrounding the home, is something that seems superficially hilarious, humorous. There's this bounce to your step when you are entering into the home. So the connotations of the porch, just positivity and humor, those connotations are continued in the discussion of the Christmas lights that usually adorn the house at this time of year. That bounce can be felt inside the house and probably inside all the houses on Wednesday Place. So homes or families represented by these houses all contain within them some kind of levity that makes them, well, homes. If they don't have that key element of humor, light and life of that bounciness that we associate with family, then to Audrey, it's not really a family at all. It's not really a home at all. It was quite a bounce. The porch also has been known to support upwards of 5,000 watts of Christmas lights. You haven't lived until you've seen our house with all its lights reflected in the pond. But tonight, there's no wattage. So all the lights have gone out because Walter is dead. The fact that the Christmas lights have been taken down and shoved into a corner, forgotten, is a representation of the loss of joy and light in their lives. The loss of light in their families. All that's left now is the reflection of nothing, pure darkness in the pond. Tonight there is no wattage. What is the wattage of a full moon? Because that's what the wattage is as we approach my house. So night has fallen on joy. The light, the levity of their entire family has been obliterated. As she comes to the door of the house, she says, our front door does not lock, but seems locked to people who don't have a special relationship with it. Again, remember that the house represents their family, as we've already seen. So the house or the family becomes something sacrosanct, defended against people who attempt to enter it, unless they're already intimately familiar with the idiosyncrasies of that place. It seems like it's locked. It seems like you're kept out from it. By those, or only to those people who don't already have a special relationship with it. It is the place for family. It can only be opened with a northwest shove. So there's this special way of opening the door, of angling your body properly and giving it the appropriate shove as you turn the handle in just the right way to get into the house and force the door open. That's a representation of the difficulty of entering into a familial relationship. There are 47 ducks, native, and two swans, not native, living on Wednesday Pond. When the swans put their heads underwater, they look like baby icebergs. When they lift their heads, they look surprised. Did you see the bottom? No, did you? No, let's check again. They've been checking for years and continue to be surprised that there's, no, that there's no bottom. So now that all the light and life of the family has been dimmed, and in fact snuffed out along with the light of Walter Flower's life, all that we see is the bottomless pond, the darkness of the surface. There are no positive lights reflecting off the surface to conceal the bottomless abyss of grief and terror, horror that is hiding behind the seemingly pleasant home that they had kept, maintained, and preserved. Audrey picks up this metaphor of the pond as grief and misery and loss or a reflection of these things on page 139. When she thinks about herself being excised and excluded from the home, we again have the reimposition of the current modern day narrating Audrey's fears on her past experience. The child narrator Audrey is experiencing the fear of being excluded from her own home, of being lost, because after all, she's staying at the civil manor. She's sort of run away from home and nobody knows where she is. As she does so, she thinks to her father, desperately searching after her in a parallel to what she's doing for her own father. She's trying to find a way to connect with the father that she doesn't quite believe is dead. She can't believe he's dead because he's trained her to believe that death is not inevitable. And in that context, 
She says of her father looking for the young child narrator Audrey, or he would check the pawn first, because what if I'd fallen in? What if he'd lost me? What if I would died? What if I was gone forever? Yes, he is, he is walking around Wednesday Pond right now, calling my name, and when I don't answer, he jumps in. The police come to dredge the pond, but lo and behold, there is no bottom to dredge, and my dad is gone, never to return. But where? Where does the pond with no bottom go? Will he splash up somewhere else? Symbolically here, Audrey is asking that age-old question of what happens to us when we die. Where is Walter Flowers now? So again, we see the, that the pond represents that fear of death and Audrey's own quest to understand where her father has emerged, if anywhere. Her past reflections give context for present circumstances, allowing her to better understand them. And in fact, it informs those present circumstances of her experience of loss and her fear of losing her father forever in ways that she can't grapple with in the present moment because the pain is too raw. Instead of dealing with them directly in the present moment, she looks back at her past and imposes on them her contemporary fears as she so often does, and is able to ask the questions that she's not able to do in the present. She can't bring herself to ask herself, where is my father now? Is he really dead? Is death the end? Where does that bottomless abyss of oblivion actually end? However, by way of these recollections, by way of her retreat into the past, she's able to reframe those questions and ask them in a way that is anodyne or harmless to her or less harmful to her. Notice the shift to present tense. That shift to present tense in her description of these events, or he would check the pawn first, so in the past tense, because what if I'd fallen in? Yes, he is walking around Wednesday Pond right now calling my name. The narrating Audrey was in the past tense, but the sh tone shifts into the present because it's a reflection of the present day Audrey's concern. So that shift in tense, which is grammatically incorrect because the tense is changing, is actually a conscious thing on the part of the author. As she is saying that it is the current narrating Audrey viewing modern events, the loss of her father into that bottomless abyss of grief and death and oblivion of the pool that is being expressed at this point. The police come to dredge the pond, but lo and behold, there is no bottom to, dred to dredge, and my dad is gone, never to return. So it's like the current narrating adult Audrey superimposes her experience and her present tense concerns on the past tense narrating Audrey. So pay attention to the function of the shift in tense here and how that is a representation of Audrey's current experience tied together by all those complex allusions and references to setting throughout this entire novel. All because he expected me to come home and I never did. But this was not what happened. So now she returns to the past tense describing what actually happened. So that moment of digression to contemporary concerns read through the past is not something that Audrey, the past Audrey, the child thought in the moment. It's the current narrating Audrey thinking those thoughts through her recollection of past experiences, coloring and reshaping them, and then trying to regain control. She lost control of the story that she was trying to tell. She unintentionally fixates on her own loss. She wasn't intentionally controlling her manipulation of her prose voice and the use of tenses. She descends into it. She almost like loses control of her narrative, of her own memories and her experiences as they come to reflect her current situation. And so often that is thematically what this text is telling us. We try to control the past, to deploy it and to manipulate it in order to better understand our current situation. However, our ability to do that, to construct a coherent narrative of our own lives and to control that narrative in order to control how we represent and understand the present is fraught with complexities and perhaps impossible. We can't do that we lose control. Now, Audrey, in that first chapter of the section that you were assigned to read for this week, also presents to us one of the reasons for her fears. She's afraid of being excluded from her family because after all, she says on page 107, but I couldn't picture grandmother and Toph being worried any more than I could picture them being lonely. Worried people have accent circumflex eyebrows. No, they were scheming. They were plotting to take over the house and then kidnap Uncle Toby. And who knows, maybe my dad too back in England. And who would be left behind? Me, the Canadian. So here, 
she's afraid of being excluded from her own family because she sees in her parents, uh, or at least in her father and her quote unquote uncle, aspects of their identity that she does not share. She is after all a pure Canadian. She was born in Canada. Both of them were born in England. And in a sense, all these fears about loss and exclusion from the family come to the forefront in terms of her national identity as well. This novel, as a Canadian novel, is intensely concerned with the delineations, the distinctions to be made between the English identity and the Canadian identity that Audrey adopts and develops in contradiction to or contradistinction from uh, the identity of her other family members. In the next set of video lectures, we'll continue to take a look at the development of these themes, and uh, I will unpack by way of close reading the next few chapters.